morning, everybody, and welcome to this meeting of the Employment and Appeals Committee. Um, do we have any apologies? Uh, I believe we have apologies from Councillor Powell who's on holiday. Um, I've not heard from Councillor Walters for this meeting. Thank you very much. Councillor Walters. Thank you. Thank you. So it is possible he wasn't aware of the meeting. I believe he was. Although I have to say, I probably didn't accept it mm -hmm. either because I never do. I saw too much technology. Um, do we have any declarations of interest, members? No, thank you. Can we move on to item three, the minutes of the last meeting? Um, does anybody have any matters of accuracy they wish to raise? No. In which case, of those of you who were present, um, can I have a proposal to accept them? Thank you, June. Second, to thank you, Jeff. All in favor? Approved. Thank you very much. Do we have any petitions, deputations, or questions? Uh, none received, Jeff. Thank you. Um, did we have any questions from members? None received. Notice a motion? None received. Okay, thank you. So we move on to HR policies. As you know, part of the purpose of this committee is to approve policies as they're being developed. And tonight we do have a couple. So can I hand over to Carol to introduce them, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, so the first paper presents two HR policies for your consideration. Um, should we take each policy um, one at a time? Okay, so the employee domestic abuse um, policy. So the council received from regional funding um, to deliver duties of the 2021 Domestic Abuse Act. Um, and we have one of our social workers who part of her existing role is carrying out a programme delivery role. So she's working with the Safer Rutland Partnership um, and also the Domestic Abuse Group. So as part of the work within Children's Services to develop the, the more wider uh, strategy, um, they talk to us about developing a specific employee policy. So this, in, in essence, um, is a policy that helps us provide a framework around and support around individuals who may be subject to um, domestic abuse. Now, clearly, it's a policy we hope we do not have to refer to uh, very often. Uh, regrettably, though, from time to time, um, we do. And our support to employees has always been um, a significant factor for them in how they have responded and been able to cope with what has been really uh, very um, tragic circumstances in some case. Um, so we do feel it's quite a welcome policy, but it isn't representing something that we haven't done before in terms, as I said, wrapping around support for individuals who have or who are, who, or who are going through domestic abuse. Um, we would still seek to consider each case on its own circumstances because they are all very different. Um, but the principles of the policy are to support work related issues, help the individual to stay safe and ease some of the pressures. Um, otherwise they may feel they have no alternative but to leave the council but we've been able to work with individuals to actually keep them in employment and that's been quite an important part of how they're dealing with the circumstances um, so the types of measures we've outlined um, in paragraph 2.3 and as outlined um, in the policy so it includes things like changes to working patterns changes of duties redeployment for example but again they are very pertinent to each individual um, case um, other support that we've put in place for individuals have included things like single points of contact within the HR team, and we've agreed, for example, certain ways of communicating and a secure approach to how we've arranged those discussions and those um, how we've managed those meetings. Um, so we do think it, it's, a, it's a welcome policy to our suite of, of policies. Um, we do hope that it's not drawn on that often, as, as I've said. Um, but I think, you know, in the context of how we support employees, it, it's important to document such a policy. So I hope you feel it's something that you can approve. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, questions or comments? Sam. 
Thank you. Um, I really, really welcome um, this policy. Um, I think it sets the right tone. I particularly like um, the um, 6.3 uh, re relating to personnel records and that um, living through abuse and surviving abuse won't affect um, long term records. And I think that's really important um, to um, allow people to come forward and disclose and um, the one the one part um that i i didn't quite um i, I don't know how to describe it i don't number five when we're talking about per perpetrators of domestic abuse um i kind of fully agree that we have um a real strong policy on it um but the bit that kind of didn't kind of wasn't quite clear was on one hand we're saying it won't be tolerated and we have a firm stand that it'll be used as disciplinary within the disciplinary process but at 5.3 rightly we do say that we will offer support to perpetrators to amend their behaviors and obviously we do know that um when we're talking about um domestic abuse um actually allowing the perpetrators sorry to um receive uh, help to um change their behaviors actually means that future victims don't go on to be victimized um so so it is really important that we do support any perpetrators that come forward and i just wondered i i've actually put is is it clear how the support works um in relation to one and point one and two so on one hand we're being um very strong in our wording um that the abuse isn't tolerated and rightly so but on the other hand we're saying but we will support you so it was just um how we're going to make that really clear to to our employees that we will support them if they are if they feel they have um issues or they're developing issues how how we will support them coming forward does that kind of make sense what i was what i'm trying to say no it does make sense um and i agree it's difficult to know how to craft it in such a policy because the circumstances again can be so varied you know someone may voluntarily say I have to divulge th this is how I am or how I have been um, and you know there's an element of again what is underneath that and what might be happening to determine how far is that support compared to how far is that a real concern about that person's behavior and conduct perhaps in relation to the, the role that they are undertaking um it is a very difficult one maybe, maybe there's something in the wording that we just need to perhaps reflect on that is saying you know there are you're right it's both those elements we do want to be supportive because you or you want to try and signpost and help that person to get the support they might need but at the same time we have to recognize that in terms of an employee's behavior and values that is not something that we could really tolerate and and you know it's difficult to deal with so i think we can reflect on the wording and perhaps you and i can have i can share something with yourself to, to see what you might be happy with yeah um yeah and that we do have i know in leicestershire there's some they've got some very good um perpetrator schemes yeah, out yeah, there okay. to to check to amend behaviors and stuff um so i suppose it might it might be worth linking in with them um, yeah. around some of the wording they might recommend i suppose what what i'm trying to say is um i rightly believe that we should it, it is a serious offense mm. and actually i I, I stand by 5.1 and yeah. 5.2, but I just think actually does that strong wording prevent people coming forward to us ask for help? And I wouldn't want that to yeah. happen. So maybe if we can liaise with um, that perpetrator scheme and maybe they can um, offer some advice on some wording or stuff so that we can assist with that and signpost. Yeah. yeah, that's fine. I think you're right. I think we can indicate something in there that is about signposting where somebody is divulging and coming forward and actually reaching out for help that we can signpost and do that yeah. yeah that that also the sorry to just back, back in i'm just going to say um because we know um that some um survivors are reluctant to come forward to change their family circumstances so actually as on a whole they might prefer to come forward under those circumstances that we can offer help as well to to change behaviors um it just might give them more um full family help um thank you for that i I think it is difficult. I mean, I don't disagree with anything you've said, Sam or um, Carol, uh, but I think it's difficult to get the wording right because on the one hand, as you say, you, you don't want to give people the impression that it's okay, 
But on the other, you do want to be able to signpost to supports. And I'm wondering if any other local authorities and any other contacts you've got through your networks, Carol, might have a form of wording that would help us. Um, yes, there certainly are. And this was uh, modelled on the Leicestershire model, but I do have a couple of others as well. So we'll just signpost back to see how they've crafted that wording. Yeah. OK, thank you. Anybody else, any questions or comments? Uh, Karen. Chair, just a minor point, but there's a typo in the first recommendation where I think it should say policy and not police. <laughs> yes, noted, thank you. I think I would probably have said policy when I came to it there. Uh, Chair. It's a difficult one from the start, isn't it? It's actually finding out with your staff because um, a lot of people say what happens behind closed doors stays behind closed doors and it's getting that confidence in your staff to start with to be able so it's it's, it's a tiered system isn't it where your, your officers have got to know individually or all, all, all the staff and be able to talk to them and and get that confidence with them isn't it it's not just you, you know, somebody turning up and saying, I, I, um, you know, somebody's hit me last night or whatever, but it's it's actually the the progression to to make sure that 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 person is is okay in the in the work that they're doing and safe at home. It's a very difficult one. I, I don't know how how you, all I can say is the more you talk with the staff and. That's what I do at work. I mean, I've only got half a dozen. And, and oh, we always have a coffee first thing at nine o'clock. And I'll go around, you know, and we go around and talk to each other. And and and, and you can sort of, you, you get a feeling if things aren't right with them and, and things like that. But um, is it, whatever you put on the paper, it's got to be that sort of um, liaison between, between the officers and the staff and, and yourselves. Any other comments or questions? Um, I will um, take the recommendation pertaining to this now before I ask Carol to go on to the second one. And can I um, ask that you approve a new employee domestic abuse policy subject to a reflection on the wording in paragraph five. And can I ask that formally, the final wording is agreed between um, Carol Chair and Vice Chair. Would that be, you can send it to everybody, Carol, but <laughs> I'm talking about the formal process. Are you happy with that, David? Uh, all, all, well, I'm proposing, do I have a second of them? Thank you, thank you, June, all, all in favor? That's you know. yes. Thank you very much. Oh, oh, it was on. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Carol, can I ask you to introduce the probation policies now, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, this is an existing um, policy and th there's no significant policy changes that are being recommended um, as part of this paper. Uh, but it is a policy that is used um, constantly because clearly it relates to new recruits. Um, we took the opportunity um, the back end of last year to um, do a bit of a mini review in terms of how the probation policy and the probation process in particular was was running and we felt that we were quite driven by process rather than quality of outcome so we did do some refresh and took the opportunity to re-emphasize in the policy particularly the importance of supporting new employees through their induction and their probation so um, for example standards of work expected expectations given feedback and so forth also, the role of our My Conversation model, which, as you know, is our one-to-one -one and supervision framework that we use. Um, so, again, we wanted to reinforce, similar to what Councillor Dale has just been talking about, in terms of the importance of regular dialogue and conversation between managers and staff. 
um, the importance of managing any concerns at an early stage. So whilst the policy is very much driven towards if we can manage these things well, invest in our new staff, induct them well, um, give them regular supervision, feedback and guidance, then we should see a good outcome. But we recognise that from time to time, unfortunately, that isn't the case. So it's important to have a very clear procedure and process for how we deal with concerns and making sure that we do address those at a very early stage. Um, and I think, again, you know, it's just overall the importance of a management role in need to manage their staff um, and managing situations really well. Um, so as part of this refresh, we will be undertaking some management briefings um, over the next couple of months. Clearly, that will include a briefing on the employee domestic abuse policy um, as well. Um, one thing I would just emphasize is something we talk here about escalations of processes and how do you deal with um, employee issues when they're more senior members of staff because clearly you know you go up a level but it gets to a point where you run out of levels to go to so you know in the um, unfortunate event that there was um, an issue for example with the chief executive post um, now those posts and within their conditions of service and within a statutory post there are specific other measures that are attached to our statutory post that includes the um, the monitoring officer and the deputy 151 um, officer as well so it's not, though it's not explicitly mentioned within the policy how we would deal with this if this was the chief executive I would just reassure you that there is a process that we would need to follow and would adopt and uh, would include for example either East Midland Councils or um, the local government association should that be um, a procedure we needed to pick up with um, so as I said before it's a refresh of our existing policy so there's no key policy directional change within this one but I just wanted to present it with you as we had taken the opportunity to to make a few tweaks and improvements to it thank you comments questions June um yeah it's not really I suppose on the probation policy it's just a question um when uh, somebody's promoted did they actually go through a new induction process they would some sort of induction but it's not a probationary period so a probationary period is, is when you first join Rutland Council no matter where you've come from um, you still undergo a six-month probationary period but it's on joining the council yeah, it's I'm not sure how formal I would call that. I think it is recognising when somebody takes on another role within the council, there is still a further form of learning, developing and growing into that new role. So again, as part of the My Conversation model and the dialogue between the two individuals, you, of course, would look at what is the development plan that enables you to move into that new job really well. What might be your extra development or training needs? How do we induct you and you know, enable you to understand what the requirements are or be clear about the requirements of that new role. But it's not a formal probationary period. Yeah. Anyone else? No. Uh, well, I've got a couple of comments. Um, given what you said, Carol, um, about the processes that we use for the more senior staff, I think in the scope of this policy, the Appendix B 1.1, we need to remove the word all. So it reads, this policy applies to new entrants to not all new entrants, because otherwise you think, oh, well, this will apply if we had a new chief exec coming in. And it's not to say they don't have processes, but just for absolute clarity. Um, and on paragraph 2.4, and if members are in agreement, I would like the last sentence to read, not managers are advised to keep some written notes, but managers are required to keep some written notes. For, I think, well, clearly obvious reasons, because you're all nodding. So on that basis, if no, anyone else want to say anything? No? Then moving back to the recommendation, can we say, uh, can I propose that we approve an updated probation policy as uh, Appendix B of this report, subject to removing the word 
all from the first sentence of 1.1 and amending the word advised in paragraph 2.42 required. Do I have a proposer? Thank you, June. Thank you, Sam. Seconding all those in favor. Thank you. Um, are you content with that, Carol? It's too late. We've proved it, but that's absolutely fine. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> not at all. Uh, thank you. We now move on to gender pay gap, um, which is agenda item eight. Uh, this is a not this specific report, but a report on the gender pay gap comes to us annually. Carol, would you like to talk to it, please? Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so this is our next round of data for 31st of March um, 22, uh, which we were required to publish by 30th of March 23, which, of course, we have done so. Um, so this forms part of our um, annual reporting, and this is, in fact, um, our sixth report. So I think we're becoming quite used to analysing and reporting on the data, and I feel that we've found a bit of a rhythm in terms of the style and approach that we take um, to reporting it. Um, just before I go on to our, our, our data, I thought it was quite interesting. I did see a press article last week about gender um, pay gap that was reporting that eight out of 10 firms apparently are still paying their male employees more than women. So they were concluding that they feel little progress has been made in closing the gender pay gap in the, in the UK. Now, clearly, they may have jumbled some of the equal pay elements um, within that, but they were citing some of the, the data um, and they were citing that although some sectors have shown some improvement um, since 17, um, 18, uh, they were showing that the latest figures in the public sector, we had reduced from about 14.5 to around 8.9. But certainly the private sectors and certainly some of the education and health sectors um, seem to be indicating that the, the, the gap was still um, increasing. So I think it's still quite an interesting area to pursue. Um, so although the article was talking about has it really made much difference, I think the fact that we are running the data, we are analysing the data, it provides an opportunity to, to really give yourself some, yourself some scrutiny over, over how you do pay, uh, particularly, across, um, uh, particularly across genders. Um, so the chart in paragraph three shows our comparisons over um, the last reporting period. Um, so again, and as we've said before, we can see the variation um, year on year. And we've spoken before about the outcomes of the data and the fact that it, it does fluctuate um, and vary. And again, our experience over these this reporting period, we've been able to understand a little bit more what is behind that and whether that has in fact been consistent year on year. And the areas we have focused on um, has been, you know, recognition of the size and nature of ourselves as, as a public sector organisation, um, and certainly around turnover um, and the profile of the workforce. So we, because of our size, we can see where and how our turnover is occurring, and it it, it becomes possible for us to to clearly draw that link between the shifts in the data. Um, I think we should also reflect on the role that our pay policy plays in terms of providing us with a clear framework around how we appoint new starters um, and our pay and grading structure um, in the fact that we do have some clear rigor and process around how movements through the pay and the grade structure takes place. Um, I think of, of a couple of points of interest in this year's um, data, I think particularly around um, we can see um, around 4.21 and 4.22 we are starting to see a bit of a growing trend in the increase of new starters who are male. You know, we are predominantly female organisation, as we'll see later on in, in the report, but we are seeing an increase in new starters who are actually um, male. So, again, that has had an impact on our overall um, uh, profile of the organisation. Um, so, yes, yeah, so the profile of the organisation has shifted again. We were typically up to about three years ago, about 75, 25 um, but now we're more around 28.6%, 28 28.8%, um, uh, sorry, um, male. So a little bit of a, a shift, as we can see over the last few years. 
Um, we do though see some shifts in that, and I think of interest um, is our corporate leadership team, who um, is now 83% female, <laughs> so um, compared to 50% only a few months ago. So, you know, when, when you draw down the numbers, you know, it's five out of six, but, it, you know, it represents a high percentage. And when we run the data as that 31st of March 23, I think it would be quite interesting to see how that has shifted our median and our mean even further. So I think it's those sort of elements as an organisation we need to look at in terms of, OK, we can see there's a variation in pay, median um, and so forth. But actually, when you look within the organisation about our profile, uh, the rigour we have around pay and grading and so forth. Um, I think overall, you know, we can come to the conclusion where we don't see any particular red flags for us in this year's report in the way that we have, we haven't in similarly in previous um, years. Um, you know, we can look at regional comparator data. It's too early to have comparator data for 31st of March 22. Um, but, you know, when we look at, you know, the large authorities within the region, uh, you know, just focus on that region or in the Isle of Wight, we always include the Isle of Wight because it's, you know, it's a small authority, but it's about the only one to find. Um, you know, th th there's still quite differences. It it's hard to draw any real conclusions or comparisons along those. And again, as we've reflected is with a lot of these authorities, again, the profile and makeup of their workforce is quite different um, to ours. So some of these authorities have their trade services in-house, some of them don't and vice versa. So um, it's, it's quite difficult to see some comparators. I, I do find the Leicester City um, figures quite quite interesting. I've, I keep thinking I need to have a little bit of a dive behind their reports because there seem to be such very little variation, um, similarly for Nottingham City Council. But um, so it's our statistical report. Um, I think we've made this drawn the same and similar conclusions to what we have done in previous um, years. Um, we'll run this year's data in the next six months or so, so we can see some early um, comparison and um, you know where we did perceive or you know had view that there might be some issues. We can do some deep dive data analysis as well. But again, a lot of our services and teams are relatively relatively small and again just a little bit of turnover and movement would be enough to to adjust the figures either way uh, but happy to take any further questions or comments on this one thank you sam thank you i've got one of my silly questions and i i've racked my head about this and and i know this is a simple answer and i can't get it in my head on at 3.1 in 2022 we've got a minus figure and for the life of me, my brain can't work out what the minus figure equates to, other than I know it means we're probably better. But I just couldn't work out whether it meant we were better or worse. And it wasn't, I was hoping you'd explain in your bit, but you <laughs> went over it. And so please enlighten my silly question. Thank you. Yeah, it's not a silly question at all. So when it's a minus figure, it means that the median pay for women is higher than men. So when you look at the... Um, uh, the the actual hourly rates in 3.2, you can see the median hourly rate for a woman is £13.71, for a male it's £13.18, so it's higher, whereas the previous year it was reversed. So yes, when it's minus, it means the figure for women is higher than men. Thank you. I thought that's what it was, but I thought I'd clarify because I wasn't sure. And I thought, actually, if anyone is watching from the outside and read the papers, they too might also be somewhat confused. So thank you. <laughs> and thank you for your question, Sam. Anybody else? Any questions or comments? No? OK, well, thank you for that. We are only noting this paper. Um, so nothing to vote on and thank you for your very clear explanation carol so moving on to item number nine the staff survey and again carol can i ask you to introduce it please yes thank you chair um we carried out a full staff survey um through september and november um last year um, prior to that, we had carried out some shorter pulse surveys over the last two or three um, years, um, but we hadn't done a survey of, of this scale for, for quite, quite some time. Um, and it felt timely to do so, um, given our experiences over the last two years and a you know, level of turbulence, um, to be fair. Um, new chief exec, Mark, was very committed that he wanted to do a survey at some point. And clearly we had had other changes at the senior leadership um, level. 
we did decide to manage the survey in-house this time, um, primarily to keep costs down, but actually we do have the technology and the ability to run a survey um, ourselves. But previously we had used an external um, provider. Uh, the level of response on this one was 56.5%, um, which is acceptable, but not as high as we would have, have liked. Um, industry standards for staff surveys are typically around 50 to 60%. Anything higher, to, higher than that is in the, in the good category. Um, just on that point, I would say for next time, um, I would certainly would want to look at our preparations in advance of, of the survey as a way to encouraging a greater update uh, uptake. So although we did a number of newsletters, we did some briefings at all staff sessions, um, I think, again, there's opportunities to reflect on perhaps how we can delve a little bit deeper into the workforce to encourage um, a higher take up. Um, we've presented the outcomes to corporate leadership team and our extended leadership team and to all staff. So I've, I've done briefings, all staff briefings, but we've also produced the newsletter, which we've provided for you um, in Appendix A, which gives you much more detail. The report that I've done really is just to give some of the, the headline um, messages and certainly our take on it in terms of overall outcome. It gives us a benchmark for further um, survey. So certainly our, our overarching satisfaction rate, which is the average of all scores, is 68.2%. So that's what we take as our benchmark um, figure. Um, and again, that is similar to the previous surveys that we undertook a number of, of years ago. Um, but there is a lot of content um, and there's a lot of detail that's been highlighted in each of the sections um, in the newsletter. I think there is some really highly positive feedback. You know, we had some favourable responses that were in the 90%, which was exceptionally good. Um, and I think, importantly, the bits that initially stood out for me straight away was it was really pleasing to see staff say that they are proud to work for the council and they're committed to the community. Um, they say they've got a good appreciation of the challenges of the organisation and the contribution they can make. And they're also very positive about respect um, and employer support. Clearly, there are some areas for us to reflect on. Um, and paragraph four of the paper summarises some of those key learning points. Um, this isn't about creating a huge to-do list for the HR team to try and, um, and put right. Um, it's about messages for the organization at all levels um, in terms of areas that we do need to reflect on. Many of which I would say are part of our day-to-day -day business and just things that we could and should do a little bit um, better. But there are some areas that we need to continue to develop and evolve a little bit uh, perhaps quicker. We are working on a people strategy to reinforce values that we do place on, on staff. Um, and importantly, what, how, and where as an organization, we do need to do things well or better. So that will help give us a bit of a structure um, and plan as we go forward. But as an organization, as I said, I want that people strategy to be seen as organizationally owned rather than something that the HR team are going to deliver. We're facilitating it, but it needs to be owned by the organization. Um, so overall, I think really, really pleased with the positivity. Um, I would say no huge surprises. I don't think we looked at the results and, and thought, oh, gosh, that's taken us you know, somewhat by um, surprise. But there are some areas that we haven't been so strong in. You know, we can't get it right 100 um, percent of the time. But, you know, there are always things as an organization you can do better and you want to do better. And, and this gives us an opportunity to listen to the voice of our staff in terms of what is most important and what is most pressing um, for them. So it gives us a, some real key pointers in terms of how we need to perhaps invest some of our energy and change going forward. But have to take any other perspectives or, or views. Um, thank you very much for that thorough introduction, Carol. Uh, June. Um, thank you. Just a, a couple of things from me. Um, um, I welcome the positivity on it. Um, there's um, one thing, obviously, around working hours, and it, it has been highlighted that staff feel um, that that is an issue. And I was um, 
wondering how we're going to take that through to transformation because I think it's really, really important that that's carried forward to the transformation programme because while we're talking, if staff are already saying, and we do know that resilience is an issue and we do know that we do sometimes ask a lot of our staff, um, I think it's really, really important that we take this voice through, that they're already feeling that there's a strain around um, the amount of work that's expected in hours um, and that, that we're mindful of that through the transformation programme um, is my first point. And then my second point comes from um, the bit that said um, we asked people if they felt they were treated fairly and with respect and 74% said yes but that um, that does mean that one in four of our employees don't think so and then we went on and I, I appreciate it might only be a few responses it talked about um, that they'd personally experienced uh, discrimination, bullying or harassment. Now, I appreciate in the um, in the document that's being published, it, it, it kind of suggests that staff speak up and things. But in our paper, it doesn't explain how we're going to address that. And I suppose um, from kind of an employment and appeals position, I felt um, there was nothing within our paper um, addressing. So in the in the learning points, it, it wasn't clearly demonstrated. Actually, one in four is quite a lot of staff on kind of it might only I, obviously we don't know the numbers of the amount that took it it might be that only 20 people took the stock took the survey so so that is I know we're working on Rutland numbers so I'm mindful that it is um, however I feel maybe we need to be a little bit clearer about how and what we are going to do about that I suppose it was um, it was worrying that although the percentage has gone up slightly um, it's still one in four, um, one in four, four employees. So it was, it was just a stance of where were we going to go with that? Because it, it just seemed a bit. We were suggesting, obviously, that people speak up, but it wasn't clear how we, as an organisation, were going to start addressing it. And I do think that is really, really important in the current climate, especially. Okay, are you happy for me to respond? Yes, I am. Yes. yes. Um, just on your, your first point, um, um, Councillor Harvey, in terms of taking those messages forward to transformation, I think, yes, we certainly hear that. Um, and you're right, this survey needs to feature in other things that we do as an organisation. You know, remember what staff said about this, remember what the feedback was about that. And certainly there were some comments in there about change, for example. And certainly staff's feeling was that. Um, they weren't always necessarily engaged in that change as much as they feel they should. And we don't necessarily always reflect on how well we have conducted that. So there was some further feedback in that, which you're quite right, needs to be front and centre in terms of how we implement and move things through um, the transformation programme. Um, in terms of your, your other um, um, comments, certainly when I gave the verbal feedback to the all staff group, I, I said exactly on the lines that, that you were saying. So although most staff are saying they feel respected, they haven't experienced any unwelcome treatment, um, some staff have. So in my verbal presentation to them, I very much gave that message. I'm not just focusing on the positive. We have to remember that some staff do not feel like that. And we talked about speaking up and having a voice and articulating that so that if people are feeling that way, we do want to encourage them to talk about it so that actually we can deal with it, respond to it in whichever way um, appropriate. So I think we gave some positive messages to encourage people to speak up. Um, it's, again, very much information and data that our equality, diversity and inclusion group will be focusing on. So um, Dawn Godfrey is our champion on EDI. Um, we're re-energising some of the work of that group. And I think there is something in there for that group to focus on in terms of helping people have that voice. Um, obviously, we don't want the behaviour to happen, <laughs> which is, 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 an, is a, another issue in terms of how we develop and grow our managers and talk about the values of our workforce. It's not just always about a manager to employ. It may be across peers and, um, and colleagues that you may feel that you're receiving inappropriate um, treatment. So I think there's something about the values and behaviours that that is not something we um, we tolerate. So and, and I certainly with the EDI stuff, we will continue to do some regular pulse surveys for that particular area because I think we do need to go back and ask the questions again and again and again because we want to get to nobody feels that they are being treated inappropriately unfairly 
um, or you know get as close to as you know perfect as we possibly can. So I think there's an element of encouraging people to speak up, focus on their values, and keep asking the questions. Yeah. Sam, I, I was just going to, is there, and I appreciate this was a confidential survey, so it will be, um, a, you can't follow up, but were there, um, I'm presuming for, for the way it was, it was kind of how the comment was made on here, that um, there may well have been um, kind of individual circumstances given in the survey so I suppose it, I would ask um, if there was any common themes um, whether they can be kind of followed up in a in a kind of thematic way um, rather than pinpointing people but and, and identifying people but um, whether some themes have come out um, with regard to um, it, it might be discrimination it might be bullying it might be um, different things so um, whether we can pull out any things and then maybe um look at uh, uh, kind of addressing them thematically across the organization yeah the, the survey itself didn't delve into that any further but i think it is something through perhaps our next pulse surveys we might want to break those questions down a little bit more yeah karen thank you chair um, carol in 3.6 there was a comment about hybrid working and I was quite sort of shocked. I, I accept the hybrid way of working, but quite shocked to see that there are some employees that didn't come into the office at all. Mm -hmm. How how does that happen? And mm -hmm. what are we doing to fix that? Um, yes, you're right. We were surprised to still see that because we had been very clear and the chief exec had been very clear that our hybrid framework and ways of working was not about people being 100% working at home. So the chief exec himself, on the back of the survey has made some further statements and comments to the extended leadership team again we will keep asking those questions and pursuing those we had a um, elt leadership session in this room a couple of weeks ago where actually our management of hybrid working was a part of that session and, and how we engage and um, um, you know keep connected with staff so the issue about that needs from time to time to be face to face you can't create necessarily that scale of connection and engagement completely through teams or by phones you know there is a need and a real benefit of coming together in whatever shape or form to help those relationships and engagement so we've reinforced that through that forum as well um, and we will do the same with our management program that will be running sometime later on this year um, as well this bit about a hybrid working and those connections and again reinforcing it's not about being at home 100 of the time we do need to see people to come in and have some level of engagement whether it's coming in for the all staff briefing whether it's coming for team meetings one-to-ones you know we've encouraged people to do one-to-ones face-to-face just as a way to, again to to get people back together again um so there's various formats that we we're still trying to reinforce it and again you know we'll ask the questions and we expect that to get to nobody saying they are at home 100 percent yeah, I think they're quite ambitious by speaking up and saying that they don't come in when we've been, <laughs> we thought we've been very clear in the message that actually at some point you come in. So, um, so at least they're being honest, I suppose, is a good thing. Yes. <laughs> Anybody else got any comments? Well, I've got one or two um, in no particular order. Um, I was... Uh, slightly worried to see the low response rate particularly within the children's services area it was only it was 19 percent, which was much lower than the others um, and also when you looked into the appendix it became clear that the people who were responding by and large were people who'd worked for the organization for a period of time uh, for, between four and seven years well, I want to know what our staff who've worked for us um, less than four years are thinking. Now, I guess if I was a member of staff and I'd only worked for the organisation for a month when this survey came out, I might feel that I didn't know enough to respond to it. But if I'd been working for the organisation for six months, then I ought to have had enough of an impression to respond to it. And so I think our senior leadership team need to be um, much firmer with the managers within the directorates about en 
encouraging people you can't make people complete it of course but encouraging people and saying you know this is actually an expectation of the organization because how can we make it better for you to work in if we don't know and that's picking up sam's point of the quarter who felt bullied and harassed you know if we'd had a 90 percent response rate might that have been 50 percent not 25 percent and so on and we can't address issues that we don't know about and we all want to make sure that our staff have as easy a life as is humanly possible within the constraints of what we all have to do. Um, I know, I know, we all feel the same way. So I, I would like to see a bit more about what senior management is doing in response to some of this survey, uh, these surveys, and it is perhaps the learning points, but it's also an actions to go with the learning. So perhaps. Um, the next time we have some, either an all-star survey or more importantly, because it'll come more quickly, one of the pulse surveys that perhaps we could, Carol, have the management response to it as well. And Kirsty is a member of senior management. Um, and I also picked up the staff not coming into the office at all. And I'm worried about that from a corporate point of view um and delivery of services we need to deliver but also from an individual's point of view because if the people who aren't coming in are also the people who live on their own that will potentially raise mental health issues of isolation and once you um stop communicating with other people it's much harder to start again and we've all experienced this to a greater or lesser extent during lockdown you know we all knew you know how much it was actually easier to stay in the house once restriction and we found lovely excuses didn't we oh well I don't really want to go out because it might be a bit busy and I might pick up COVID and I don't want to do that and it all sounded very honorable when in fact the reality was we had got ourselves into a position of, of being comfortable where we were and that could in turn lead to mental health problems. So I think that's one again that senior management need to pick up because if we are saying to staff, hybrid working is about being in the office as well as being at home, then there is no reason why people should not be in the office some days each week. And I think I, well, I don't think I said, I know I said quite a while ago when we were discussing the hybrid working policy that I would prefer to have an office-based policy with flexibility to allow people to work at home. The outcome would have been exactly the same, but the message would have been very different. Um, and I'm still a bit of that view, but hey-ho, I'm swimming against the tide nationally on that one, in terms of wording at least. Um, so those are my comments, which I hope Carol will take on board uh, and we will hear more in due course. Okay, so that was for noting. And then moving on to exit interviews, which this committee has uh, shown an interest in, hence this report tonight. Carol. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, yes, members asked at the last meeting for some feedback, both on the process that we went through to um, get information from individuals who are leaving us um, and also some analysis of that um, data. So, again, this is really important feedback um, for us. Clearly, we'd prefer to know about issues prior to someone um, leaving as they could be issues that perhaps we could help um, with and retain the individual within the organization. Um, again, our, our my conversation and supervi supervision model is key to that, um, enabling and supporting regular conversations and dialogue between manager and employee, and hence an opportunity, hopefully, for people to have that voice and share resolve um, concerns um, and issues. It's not always possible. Um, we can't always meet everybody's um, expectations, as we know, and sometimes things just do not go, um, do not go well. Um, currently, the process um, that we undertake um, has two stages um, to it, um, and it asks initially individuals to provide a statement um, and a rating against a range of um, of items and um, paragraph three provides the analysis and feedback 
for 22-23, which I'll, I'll pick up some of the headline points um, in a moment. And then we can follow that up with an exit interview, which is currently through a member of the HR team. Um, now, the take up to that is quite low. People are quite happy to fill in a questionnaire or predominantly quite happy to fill in the questionnaire. Um, people aren't necessarily um, willing or happy or want to um, go through a particular um, interview with with someone to talk any further about. They feel they've had their, their voice and had their statement and they feel fine um, with that. Um, again, I think there is some really positive um, feedback uh, in there. Um, but again, some, some issues to highlight around individuals and their decisions um, for leaving the council. Um, I don't think we're overly surprised to see that perhaps issues around development, career progression, and perhaps pay in terms of conditions are ones we're not overly surprised, you know, are perhaps some of the top reasons for people um, to leave. People get to a point where they feel perhaps there is nowhere else for them to, to go or progress within um, the organisation. Um, however, you know, a lot of people do indicate that their job was fulfilling um, and was challenging. So um, as a similarly pay terms and conditions, don't always meet everybody's expectations or they get to a point when clearly they want to search that next job that is going to perhaps pay them pay them more uh, and certainly as I said pay was one of the top mentions in terms of reasons for leaving um, so as I said fewer people do go through the exit interview process itself so we've got limited feedback in terms of what people are providing um, to us um, but I've given a, a couple of bullet points there again but it's not based on a huge amount of, um, of data um, we have already improved um, the process that we've undertaken. We, we updated and improved the questionnaire um, last year, and that, that has had an impact already. As you can see, um, in 2.4, we have had an increase in the uptake of completing the, the exit interview uh, form itself. So, so that's been, been really pleasing um, to see. Um, but I think still things for us to reflect on as a process to, again, encourage, as we said with the staff survey, a greater take up. Uh, because it is still valuable information to have, even though it is at the stage that somebody um, is leaving, because it supplements quite well with staff surveys in any event. So um, I think there is an element for us to have a look at in terms of, again, perhaps a process and system that could help engage and encourage a bit of um, increased um, take up. Um, I think we do need to you know, still reflect and learn from the messages and share that widely. So after this meeting, I will share the, the analysis and reports with our extended leadership um, team and our uh, corporate leadership team. Um, and again, it's one of those areas I'm, I'm you know, really quite interested to compare and contrast to other organizations as to how they might have evolved their own exit interview process to see if there's something, again, that we can learn from others on how they adopt it. Um, so again, some really useful feedback. I think, as I said, I was pleased to see a greater return this year um, than the year before. Um, sits along nicely with the feedback from the staff survey again in terms of feedback and lessons learned and how we need to uh, perhaps move things forward um, and hopefully you know re retention is our key answer to our recruitment problem so you know <laughs> we want to keep people working here and hopefully feeling they can develop and grow their career and I think as I've said in this meeting before we have got a lot of good examples where people have really developed and enhanced their career here so um, I've been looking for some willing volunteers as my case studies but I think I might have to go and tap on a few shoulders and then we can start showcasing exactly what is the art of the possible in terms of moving your career on. Um, surely our chief executive could help you with that. As I That's can, a very good example. Yes, it's a very good example. As I yeah. can remember interviewing him for an assistant yeah. director role many years ago. Absolutely. Yeah. And similarly, our strategic director of adults and health when I first joined team manager. Indeed. She? In adult, she's yes. been service manager, head of service, and now yes. is acting director. So, yeah, we've got a lot at the various levels. We've yeah. got some really great examples of individuals that come in as community mm -hmm. support workers who are now coordinator roles. Um, and actually have now gone up to assistant manager roles as well. So we've got we've got plenty of them to, to showcase. Yeah. And our um, uh, director for adult services as well has had real career opportunities in that she began life in the children's services. And so she even expanded her interest <laughs> during her time with us. So, yes. Um, Maybe my comment was a little facetious at the beginning there, though, but actually we do need 
to have leadership from the top. And if you are finding people resistant, then you do need to be looking at the managers and saying, look, you show your, your route within Rutland and encourage others to do the same. Sorry, I'm going off on one there. Um, comments or questions from anyone? Sam? I was just going to say um, there weren't any real surprises in, in here. I think um, the one thing I thought was, um, obviously, this is coming on the back of um, the new ways of working post-pandemic. And I'd be interested in seeing how the trends play out over the next couple of years. I think that will be really interesting, certainly around work-life balance and all of that sort of thing, um, because we know people re-evaluated how, how their lives are during the pandemic. So um, this will be the first kind of post-pandemic it's really good to see that we're having more take up because it is really really valuable information um but yeah i i would just be interested to see how the trends move on say over the next five years i think for the organization we could really get some good learning from it uh, thank you can i request therefore on the basis of that and i think you're absolutely right that um we have a further report in a year's time, please. I assume this committee would be happy with that, but it may not be this committee in a year's time. But nevertheless, I think it's valuable for the new committee to have. Any other questions, comments? No, I, I, I also thought it was interesting. Um, and I agree with Sam that we do need to review it and see if there are changes over time, especially as we will have that transformation program and see whether that has any impact as well. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I have not been informed um, of any business that I might take as urgent. However, I would like to say um, a formal thank you and goodbye to Councillor Jeff Dale, who is not standing for re-election. Jeff has given a great deal to this council over the years, both as a ward councillor, um, as chairman of the council, as chairman of various scrutiny committees and so on, and uh, a lot more than even I'm aware of because he has been on this council a lot longer than I have. And I and we haven't had a chance to say goodbye and thank you to Jeff. So I would like to do that on behalf of us. Thank you very much. Um, Um, with all that, can I close the meeting? Thank you.